We've all been there. We're too afraid to take that leap, take that challenge. And so we don't, or we decide to, and then we continuously doubt ourselves. Hey everyone, Dr. Jones here, host of the podcast, See to Lead, a podcast designed specifically to help leaders confront and overcome their everyday challenges. And this week, I talked to Dr. Rhonda Rose, author of The Deliberate and Courageous Principle. This conversation is so good that I promise you're going to want to hear the name of that book again, The Deliberate and Courageous Principle, and pick yourself up a copy because it's not just for principals, but leaders of all levels. The conversation was so good that this is actually part one of a two part series. In this part, Rhonda covers five courageous skills building relationships, reframing conflict, holding people accountable, leaning into the positive, and turning inward. She offers so much value that you're definitely going to want to lean into this episode. This will help you move from being too afraid to take a risk to taking those risks, to move from doubting yourself to believing in yourself so that you can become the best version possible. So here's the ask. Listen to this episode, subscribe wherever you listen to Seeing to Lead. Don't forget to leave a rating and review and then comment on social media with your greatest takeaway. It helps to show more than you know and helps us all keep learning by spreading this valuable information. Now, let's get to getting better with Dr. Rhonda Rose, author of The Deliberate and Courageous Principle on Seeing to Lead. Do you love your people? Do you build relationships with them? Can you handle conflict when it comes up? Because something's always coming up, right? Do you hold people accountable in a beautiful way? authentic way? Do you lean positive in the midst of all the negative stuff going on? Dr. Chris Jones here and welcome to Seeing to Lead, a show designed to help leaders increase their ability to effectively support, engage, and empower their staff through intentional practices so that they create an environment where everyone reaches their greatest level of success. On Seeing to Lead, communication rules the day as we hear voices from both teachers and leaders in an effort to examine perspectives, highlight misunderstandings, and provide steps to ultimately bridge the gap between what teachers need and provide through thought dialogue. This show is about amplifying voices, creating understanding, and providing information to help everyone continually improve. I want to personally thank you for taking the time. Now, let's get to getting better. Dr. Rhonda Rose is an educational consultant coaching principals, district leaders, and administrative teams in the complex and ever-challenging work of leading schools. She's a former director of middle schools in New Albany, Indiana, where she led curricular improvement aligning those efforts with the district's progress in becoming a professional learning community. Rhonda has served as a guidance counselor, English teacher, middle school principal, and district administrator. She's also taught graduate courses in educational leadership. Rhonda's long list of honors includes the 2010 Indiana Middle School Principal of the Year, 2011 Solution Tree Redefining Excellence District Award, and the 2015 Indiana University Southeast Educator of the Year. Dr. Rose received a bachelor's degree in English from Eastern Kentucky University, a master's in counseling from Western Kentucky University, her administrative license from Butler University, and her doctorate from Indiana State University. Rhonda currently lives in Louisville, Kentucky with her husband, Vic. As a fan of leadership development, I'm incredibly happy to have Rhonda on the podcast today. We just had a fantastic conversation before I hit record that we had to end up hitting record to get the episode. Her recent book, the Deliberate and Courageous Principle is a great read, full of examples and resources for today's leaders. Seriously, put this one on your reading list and pick up a copy on Amazon, I'm asking you, because I'm certain you're going to understand why after hearing us talk about it over the course of this episode, you are going to want a copy. That said, Rhonda, welcome to Seeing the Lead. Chris, thank you so much for having me today. And you're right. We just had a lovely half hour conversation. And we could have go in for a couple of hours. So nice to meet you in person, Chris. Thanks. Oh, it's great to meet you too. And I, it was funny because we had a look and say, hey, look, we're going to get this done. We better start. We better start recording. But um, so, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff between ourselves, but we also touched on some of the things in the book. Why this book? 
the deliberate and courageous principle. So Chris, I was a middle school principal for 10 years. And the absolute entire time I was serving as a middle school principal, I had this question ringing in my head, which was, do you know what you're doing, Rhonda, trying to lead this building? I never, ever really knew if I was doing what really effective principals were doing. And when I say effective principals, I mean, you know, leaders of schools who had even high poverty, anything over 50% free and reduced lunch, and yet they were still getting high achievement on their state attestment assessment, you know, the game of our state assessments. Because I thought, if other people are doing this, we should be able to do this too. But I doubted myself, Chris, the entire time. And we were getting results, right? We were getting gains slowly but surely. So after doing my doctoral work on that same question, hey, what are effective principles doing that have high poverty and high achievement? What are they doing? And the university allowed me to do qualitative research where I got to go visit people because now you already know, I just want to talk to people, right? <laughs> to people. So I got to interview the principals and their teachers. We know teachers have the hardest job. Everything should revolve around teachers. So they allowed me to interview their teachers. So when that research was done, my colleagues said, hey, will you come and share with us what you learned from your research? So I left my district as the assistant superintendent. And I remember I only had two gigs, Chris. I thought, this is scary. I'm going to need to make some money somewhere, but I'm going to try this. It was so in me to do it. So after doing that for maybe about three years, Solution Tree had reached out to say, would you put this in the form of a book? And the book is simply my story of, you know, what does a leader do? What does the principal do? And how does the principal And because I've come to fully believe, Chris, there are two sides of leadership. There's do we know what we're doing, right? Curricularly, all of those questions, getting all of your systems built. The other half of leadership is as important. And I think we overlook it. And that is, do you love your people? Do you build relationships with them? Can you handle conflict when it comes up? Because something's always coming up, right? Do you hold people accountable in a beautiful, authentic way? Do you lean positive in the midst of all the negative stuff going on? So there are two parts to the book. And now I've forgotten your question, but the reason I wrote the book was get it down in writing, right? So the solution tree, the editors were wonderful to me. And they said, okay, We're going to focus you in on the five actions, the deliberate actions for principals to be doing and the five courageous skills that they must have. That is how this book came into being. But it's really just a practitioner guide. It's just somebody who's done it and been there. And here's what I would do. Here's what don't do this because this did not go well. All those stories are in it. I love that you called it a practitioner's guide because that's exactly what it is. So one of the other things that I was thinking while you were talking about that, because you said you forgot the question, but it was like, let it rip. You were doing it. You were explaining it great because you talked about something that I think resonates with anybody that wants to be a leader or that is a leader. And it's that doubt that those scary situations that one, hold current leaders back, but two, hold people back from stepping into more formal leadership roles because of that doubt that they have always going on. So I was going to title it, if you didn't say a practitioner's guide, I was going to call it inspiration broken down. It's about doing and action. It's because it's truly inspiring. The idea of, of what you've done and what you did with this middle school in this high poverty area, it's inspirational. People get inspired, but that doesn't mean they can act on it. And I think this book handles that and does that. Oh, Chris, thank you for putting it that way. No one has. And, you know, that doubt, and we can call it that imposter syndrome. And I think I tell the story early on. You've written books, Chris. So, you know, sometimes I think, wait, did I put that in the book? (laughs) Anyway, I think it's up front. But the year on that, our state, the state of Indiana gives that, you know, oh, middle school principal of the year. I remember walking up front to accept that award going, oh my gosh, they're going to figure out 
this year with so many people paying attention to you. They were lovely people to me. They're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just guessing. I'm guessing my way through this work. I literally, Chris, as I walked from my round table in that, you know, conference hall, right? Walking up to the stage. That was what I was thinking. Oh, they're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just guessing my way through, right? That's how heavy the imposter syndrome was. And I bet you're going to say this too. I don't know this though, Chris. I never planned to be a principal. Never. I was going to teach English, got my guidance counselor license. I loved being a guidance counselor so much. I was at a high school. I just loved it. And that's where I was going to say. My principal came to me to say, Rhonda, we want you to go get your administrative license. And I said, yeah, no, thank you. This is good here. And they said, well, you know how it goes, Chris. You know, get this degree. It'll bump you up on the pay scale. We won't help, you know, fun part of it. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. So I thought, I'll go get this license and I will not ever use it. I never planned. But when we moved down to Southern Indiana, we were in the Indianapolis area. I I interviewed to be a guidance counselor. Chris, they did not hire me. Hurt my feelings so bad. They said, no. We don't have a guidance counselor, but we're going to make you an assistant principal. And I went, oh, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble now. That's how my story played out. There was no intent to lead a building. And I think I've come to believe, Chris, sometimes those are the best leaders. Right, right. The ones that aren't like striving for that position. I, right. It's funny because, you know, the idea that you didn't have the intent to do it. And I want to go back to that because you did put that story in the book. But I, I still remember where I was sitting. I didn't either. Imagine that. We talked about how much we're kindred spirits that we found out about each other as we were talking. I remember where I was sitting when the principal that I was teaching under yes. had received a principalship at another school. And I got a phone call from that principal and that principal said, hey, I really want you to come be my assistant principal and my special education team chair because you know I want somebody that I can trust that's hardworking and that I know has people's best interests in mind. And I said, geez, you know, I, I don't know. And they said, no, you would be good at this. And I, I really want you to do it. And besides, don't you want to make a bigger impact than you are now? And that's, that's what hooked me. Because here's the disclaimer. If you're doing it for pay, don't do it. Oh, If that's the top of your list, don't do it. We all are that quickly, don't we? Oh, yeah. right? It seems like a lot of money from our teacher pay up because we don't pay educators. Obviously, we all know that. What is deserved for them. But no, it, the, the little bit of the more money does not equal that. But I can't believe that, Chris. I should believe that. So somebody came to you to say you had no intent either, right? So golly, how interesting. Yeah, it's funny. I still remember, and that was far away from my home. I had my two kids. And as I already explained to you and people that listen to this, I'm a gushing father. So I'm not going to get on a roll about my kids, but so stay, keep listening because I'm not going to talk about my kids. But I had to move closer to home because I didn't want to spend late nights out missing a day because of the different sleep schedules. And it wasn't fair to my wife. Right. So I moved closer. And I remember when I got hired for an assistant principal job closer to my house, the principal said, I, I don't know if you want to hang on that long, but I, you know, I'm only going to be here for like five years. So if you want to hang on that long, I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, before you move up to a principal and grab a principalship somewhere, I was like, I have no intention of going anywhere. Like, like, I kind of came into this to do this. I have no intention of climbing. I'm not a climber. And five years is a long time. Right. No climbing. Right. And I think because there's been so much of the climbing, in, you know, administrative positions. And now, especially Chris, with, I feel like fewer educational leaders, people can leave certain positions and climb to others even more quickly than it used to be done. But, you know, we know that when a leader is in a building, I just feel like, you know, I was there for, I think it was 10, maybe it was nine. I know it was nine, possibly 10. But Oh, I know it took us four years till we really had the engines running and we were a well-oiled machine and things were going. And it takes a while for people to understand, oh, she's not leaving us. She's really here for a while. She's going to stay with us while we try to get this done. Now, there might have been a couple of wishing, you never know. Boy, those years of being the leader in that school are the most meaningful as I look back on my career. 
hands down, no doubt. Supporting your teachers and students seems to be a struggle. They just don't seem to be engaged. You wish they would take more responsibility for their learning and culture of the building, but they just don't seem to be empowered enough to do it. So my question is, have you checked out the book Seeing to Lead yet? It's all about creating a true educational experience where learning, growth, leadership, and community take center stage. Full of strategies and resources, Seeing to Lead is about attaining that goal by employing a model that supports, engages, and empowers all individuals to become leaders themselves. Pick up a copy today at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com. Remember, you don't become a leader and then decide you need to support and recognize others more than yourself. It is the moment you realize it's about supporting and recognizing others that you become a leader. Seeingtolead.com. So, and just to, and I mean, I, I can't agree with you more, but I definitely want to get to just to switch gears for a minute because as you're talking about how it took you the time to do it, you're talking about the doubt that you had, even getting the pinnacle of the award for the state that you're still doubting yourself. It just highlights how, how real that is for people. And when you, we talk about the deliberate and courageous principle, that's what I like because you mentioned Solution Tree told you that they need five deliberate actions and five skills, and which is what I like about deliberate actions, courageous skills. So you want to talk about those five at all and why you find them to be most important? Oh, yes, sure. Sure. And I'm going to jump to part one is all about the five actions. And then part two is all about the, you know, the five skills. So I'm going to start with part two because, you know, many times we refer to these as the soft skills, the lesser skills, they're not as important. And I firmly believe they are as important, maybe even a little bit more important if you want to get the actions done. So quickly, I'm going to run down through these just right out of the top of my head. The first skill is all about, do you build relationships with your staff, and I start with your staff, any adult in the school. And when we go there, we talk about some simple things about, are you really reliable? Do you overbook? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you do the hard things at the school that you're asking other people to do? All of that, being reliable and being vulnerable, being open with your people so they know a little bit about you. In one of my top 10, I had like a top 10 expectations that I started the school year with, right? Top 10. So that I think teachers deserve that. Hey, these are the basic expectations. I'm not ever going to talk about them again, right? I will come to you individually. Like, let's be on time. Use every minute of the day. Come to me when I make a mistake. Speak positively about our school when you're out in public. For the heaven's sake. Sit with your kid when it's sim, please. Right? All those pin things, right? And so when you're vulnerable, then people know, hey, that's why in the top 10, I put when I mess up, come to me. Maybe not group together and everybody talk about me bad. Just come to me because I'm going to mess up and I want to grow and get better. Anyway, and then we talk about some of Pat Lencioni's work. He's head of the table group. He wrote five dysfunctions of a team. But he's got one in there that's about don't ever talk about your people's fundamental attributions. Like, you know, Chris, if, if you're my math department chair and you don't show up to the meeting and then I start saying things like, oh, Chris, he's not dependable. Man, he's lazy. He said he was going to his son's dental appointment. I don't know if that's true or not. He probably made that up. But if I start talking and saying these things, these are about your character. Then I, Pat Lencioni will talk about, I don't even know if you can regain that trust because I've just told your whole math department these yucky things about you. Like you were probably lying to me when you said you were going to your kid's dental appointment, right? You never have your data in, all of those things. And he really focuses in on how harmful and toxic it is for your organization. And we want our schools to be very healthy organizations, right? So that's all that stuff in that one skill of building relationships. Oh, the other thing in there, Chris, is 
do you have the really hard conversations with people that you need to have? And I don't know how this went for you, but I was scared to have those hard conversations. Like I'd, I'd set it up real well. This is what we're going to do this semester. But then if people weren't doing it, I didn't go follow up like I should. So there's a model in there that was a life changer for me on how to have those dialogues. Okay. The second skill is about, can you reframe conflict? I didn't know as a young principal that there's always going to be a little something off, right? There's always going to be conflict. I thought I'd fix it all and people would be happy and good evermore. (laughs) And it doesn't go that way. Just looking at conflict and how it can be a positive thing as you're nudging your building forward, right? That's conflict. The third skill is holding people accountable. And what I say here is, Chris, we cannot hold teachers accountable until we've given them the gift of clarity. I don't think we're clear enough. We're not fair to teachers, right? Like teachers, every department, right? I'm sitting with each one of them. Okay, you guys, here's what we got to get done this semester. And here's your role in it. This is why you're so relevant. You set your little goal on this, right? So once you've been really clear with people, that's one of the actions up in the first part, right? Then you can hold them accountable. Accountability became so much easier for me when we've been clear up front. And that clarity is not just Rhonda telling them what to do. That's where I have conversations with them. Like, okay, if our kids are going to do better, right, at making inferences, if we're going to do better at writing, blah, 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 here's what we're going to do this semester. Everybody agrees on that, right? And then accountability comes. Okay, the fourth skill is this one that I call, do you lean positive? There's so much negative, Chris. We talked about this earlier too. Somebody's always a little upset, whether it's a staff member, parent, school board member, somebody at central office. And I leaned more negatively than I wanted to, Chris. I'm embarrassed to say that. I don't think my staff saw it that way. I think they would tell you, oh, she was a positive, optimistic person. But I'm saying internally, I dwelt, I perseverated on the negative way too much. So through those years, I came up with, I think I got six in there, six different tools that helped me lean more positively to put down the negative. We had the way I could handle that. And honestly, Solution Tree said, oh, we're not going to put all six of those in there. We'll just do the top three because they send the book out, I guess, to about 50 people and they take their comments back. It's so funny, Chris. That's the chapter where they went, oh, everyone says, please leave all six. Yeah, everybody needs that. Yeah, I don't think people know how hard this is on principles. It's a hard job to do well. So I won't go into those six tools. But they really, really helped me. I think I knew Sean Aker's book, The Happiness Advantage. I got a couple from him. You know, I just was stealing from everybody. Okay. And then the last skill is turn inward because I didn't do this enough till the end of my career, Chris, where it turn inward. I simply mean get quiet every now and then. That can be prayer for people. That could be meditation. That could be, for me, it became journaling like, At the end of the week, somewhere on a Saturday or Sunday, I would just pose the question of where could I have been better last week? And just reflecting and trying to let things stabilize, coming to a good place where I was ready for the next week. I, as a leader, I just ran full force from week to week, week to week. That was me. I was just running, and I needed to stop and reflect because I would have told you, I don't have time to do that, Chris. I don't have time for that. But I became a better leader when I stopped and took time to slow down and look at it. So in a very quick, sorry, what was the rough now of the <laughs> five skills? Do any of those sound more interesting than others to you? I'm curious. They all sound interesting to me. I And, you know, some of them resonate with me. The hold people accountable one man, it's tough to have those conversations and not not so much, well, it's tough to have the conversations, but you can map out conversations and things like that and you have, and you have the tool to do that. But the idea of actually circling back to do it because it's so easy to say, well, they're not where they need to be. 
But taking that second step to, so what am I going to do about that? Because it's, yes, they're accountable, but it's my responsibility, which people mix up accountability and responsibility. It's my responsibility to make sure that they're accountable for what they're responsible for doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And the model that's in the book, and this is an interesting point. I'm going to add this. We put that model of having difficult conversations. They said, Solution Tree said, Rhonda, you need to put that in holding people accountable. And I said, I really don't want to. And here's my reason why. Because if I've said in front of my staff on opening day, I would give a little vision for the school year, not the school's vision statement. This is Rhonda's. You guys, here's where I think we can be by the end of the year. I want them to know, ooh, I got all kinds of ideas and stuff. We're going to get done, right? So I'd give the vision. Then I'd give the top 10, right? Those top 10. Okay. And I told them, I'm going to talk about the vision all the time. I'm going to drive you crazy with that. But I'm not going to bring up these top 10 things. I will come to you individually if there's ever an issue with those, like one of them was be on time and be at your duty. Okay. So when I started going, Chris, to the staff members who needed to have a conversation, right? Because they're late or they're not at their, you know, morning duty. I was shocked by the amount of people who found out about that because I thought when I went and talked to that teacher, only that teacher and I would know. But then people would come and go, oh, thank you for talking to Sierra or whoever. Thank you for talking to Sarah about being late. And I'm like, I don't do people know that I talk to Sarah. And Chris, it's because Sarah goes and tells everybody, can you leave Ron to talk to me about being late? I was shocked as a leader that happened, but I left it in the building relationships because Chris, I had no idea what good that did for our building when I held people accountable to what I said we would do. So it builds trust in all good people who are killing themselves to do everything. So that's why we left that in the chapter on build trust with your people. So go talk to the people you need to. Nothing tears down good teachers than letting the teachers who are skimming by, letting them buy with it, right? So that's why we kept that there. And a lot of people will ask me, why didn't you put that over in in the accountability. And Chris, I w- one last thing. Whenever lately, when schools will reach out, because if schools reach out and order a certain number of books, then I can even do a free, you know, virtual or two with them. But they always ask for the skill on staying positive. I thought they'd be more interested in some of the work stuff. No, no, <laughs> they don't really care about the work stuff. They were like, well, you do one of our virtuals on the six tools on being positive. So that must resonate a bunch more. It makes me feel not as lonely that other principals were struggling too. 100%. And the positive one is the other one that really sticks out with me because I'm always positive or I always try to be positive and that's not always easy. For some reason, I've always found it easier to not perseverate on certain things. So I'm pretty good clearing my plate and being able to go on that way. But one of the mysteries that I struggle with is what you were just talking about. So holding teachers accountable to build trust. I've never understood. That's a great way to do an end around teachers to build trust of the teachers that are really killing themselves because I've never understood why teachers don't say to other teachers, hey, Rhonda, I noticed you always come in late. Could you, we're supposed to be on time. Why don't you be on time? They will never do that. They'll complain about it, but they'll never do it. And when when Rhonda comes to Chris and says, can you believe so-and-so talked to me about being late? And they sat me down and talked to me and said that the expectations are that I'm on time all the time. And I, Chris, will look at you and go, Ron, I can't believe it. I, You know, how really he's going to pick on you for that? And then you're going to go away and I'm going to turn around and go, thank God he said something. What, Chris? That is exactly it. That's exactly it because... Truly, truly, I had two teachers on an eighth grade team come to me about, I'm just using the name Sarah, being late, right? And I I went, "Uh uh-oh, red flag, red flag. They should be able to talk to Sarah, right? They're on the same team. And then I realized teachers are not going to do that until they see their leader holding people accountable. And once I started modeling it, and I will say that took two or three semesters, Chris, 
you know, deliberate modeling, holding people accountable, then it does switch over to teachers will start saying, hey, remember that's in Rhonda's top 10 or something, blah, blah, blah. But, and I don't blame teachers. They're not going to do it if we're not. But then when the teacher goes to them, those two that came and like ratted out their teacher, when Sarah went and said, can you believe she talked to me about me? like, no, I can't even believe she. Because <laughs> I overheard it. And I went, dad, gone you too. You're the two that came to me. You know, right. That's what it goes. Right, right. And I get it because they have to live with them. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the biggest mistakes I, well, no, that's not one of the biggest. That's one of the mistakes I made. If you want to see another one, hang out 10 minutes. I'm sure I'll make a few more. But that's one of the mistakes I made is I told people in a faculty meeting, I said, look, I've got teachers coming to me telling me that teachers are being negative and teachers are, you know, showing up later, not doing this. Say something to each other. Or I guess continue to come to me, say something to each other. And I had a teacher raise their hand in the faculty meeting and say, so you want us to rat each other out? So it was suddenly there was that, you know, we were walking that line of us against them because they didn't, because they're with the teachers and they didn't want to be seen as telling on some teachers. Just like kids, right? It's just like kids. But that's that research from, you know, Lencioni's work with teens. Healthy teens can do this. Healthy right. can hold each other accountable. But my biggest learning curve there was they're not going to do it until the leader does. And Chris, that was such a pivotal shift for us because when I started doing it as hard as it was and I was scared to do it and the model in there is from Peter Singe. It's one of his frameworks. And then, oh, it really helped me to be able to step through those four quadrants. But the culture in that building began to shift a little bit in the accountability piece. It, it, in the beginning, it was all on me. It was as the leader, but then it will shift to where your teams will hold each other accountable because that's just the way we do it here. And that, that's a beautiful thing to see take place. So Rhonda, we've gone about a half an hour and you've got so much more to say. So I, I haven't done this on air before, but I'm going to ask you on air if you'd come back and do a part two that we could air back to back. I would be thrilled to do that, Chris. The blame's on us because we did so much talking. We podcast, but maybe we talked a lot about part two and the skills. So in the next one, we could get more over there on the actions maybe. I would be honored to do that. 100%. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up here to make sure that, you know, I want to make sure I respect time constraints that you have and time constraints that I have. So what I'll do is I'll wrap this up, but I'll say this is part one. And just from part one, I'm sure people listening to this are going to want to go out and pick up a copy of this book. Just because for the skills piece alone, because like you said, that's important. That's got to come first. And you offer so many tools that this really is kind of a guidebook. So thanks for being on. You and I can hop off and schedule another time. And uh, we'll go from there. How's that sound? Great. Thank you so much, Chris. It means so much to me. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Dr. Jones here just to close this out really quick. And, and thank you for taking the time to listen to another episode of Seeing to Lead. This podcast truly is designed to help leaders with their everyday problems by offering practical advice, solutions ready to be implemented, and frameworks for improvement. As you heard me say at the close of last episode, this was just part one. Be sure to come back for part two of my interview with Rhonda Rose, the author of The Deliberate and Courageous Principle. And as always, I ask you to hit that subscribe button and leave an honest rating and review. I'd also love to hear your comments or suggestions for guests on social media. So drop that comment with your biggest takeaway. Thanks for listening. Now you go have a great week. Well, that's a wrap, but not the end. Next step, be sure to take action on something you heard here today. 
Hey, thanks for listening to the Scene to Lead podcast. If you would like to connect for any reason, email me at drchrissj at gmail.com or catch me on Twitter at Dr. C.S. Jones. If you've gotten any value from the Scene to Lead podcast today, you can help me and other leaders create a world-class environment through a teacher-centric approach by subscribing to the show, leaving an honest rating or review, and sharing this episode on social media with your most valuable takeaway. Also, one last thing. Have you had a chance to pick up my latest five-star rated book yet? Grab your copy of Seeing to Lead anywhere you buy books or at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com, where you can learn more and continue to improve. Now go have a successful week. 